The Opening of the Field by Robert Duncan. The poems in Robert Duncan's The Opening of the Field were written between 1956 and the beginning of 1959, the final two referring to events of 1958, the publication of Louis Zakowski's Barely and Widely, and on October 13th, the U.S. release of Ingmar Bergman's The Seventh Seal. Duncan appears to have known since his teens and he's 41 in the 1960s, since his teens, that he was going to write a major work, a mature writing that would propose a poetry on the scale of Ezra Pound's Cantos, William Carlos Williams' Patterson, Charles Olson's Maximus, and Zakowski's then interrupted Project A. Zakowski had stopped writing it in 1950, wouldn't pick it up again until 1960. The opening of the field and the four books that follow are that work. Duncan took care to set the stage for the best possible reception of this project. He gathered his early writings, those composed up into 1950, into his selected poems as part of City Light's Pocket Poet series in 1959. Works written between 1950 and 1956, the poems ultimately gathered in the Fulcrum Press edition of Derivations, were issued for the most part as a series of chapbooks, some published by Duncan himself through his press, Ankadu Surrogate. But as he acknowledged in a list of books by Robert Duncan and the selected poems, The Field, slightly different title, Poems 1956-59, was unpublished and for much of 1959 had no good prospects for finding a publisher. Duncan had had an agreement with Macmillan that had come apart over his insistence that the book's cover use the artwork created for it by his lover Jess, a homey sketch with a collage photograph of children playing a circle game. That Duncan even thought of turning to a New York trade publisher is telling. He was notoriously fussy with his publishing, not permitting Ferlinghetti to reprint selected poems, insisting that the first volume of Groundwork be set in Courier to capture the true copy of his typed originals. After contemplating publishing the field himself, Duncan finally let Donald Allen with whom he is, was in constant correspondence over the subject, take the project on as a Grove Press Evergreen original coming out in October of 1960 with Jess's artwork used as the frontispiece and a clever Roy Coleman cover design that used the photo of the kids under an abstract falling leaf pattern and both title and the author's name in what I believe is Duncan's own handwriting. Although the Duncan I first met in Jack Gilbert's class in 1966 argued adamantly against all forms of revision, the title of this volume changed between 1959 and 60. There were also changes in the poems and in their order. Often I am permitted to return to a meadow, the book's first poem, had originally been titled Having Been Enraged by John Davenport. <laughs> but this was to be the start of a great project, and Duncan wanted very much to get it right. He was very conscious of the fact that he was proposing a writing that could be as continuous as the cantos. But like Sikofsky and Olson before him, Duncan also found the need to break down parts within. Each of the five books that make up the unnamed project can be read as collections of discrete poems. In addition, two very different ongoing sequences, the structure of rhyme and the canto-like series passages are woven throughout. When in 1974 I wrote in an essay on the opening of the field, and that's what's up on my blog today, 
for John Taggart's issue of Maps devoted to Duncan that Duncan might issue these two sequences as separate volumes, Duncan replied in an annotated copy of my essay that he gave to the Australian poet Robert Adamson that structures and passages belong to the books in which they appear as is, exclamation point. They have never been issued separately, though in fact both would make great little books on the scale of spring and all, or say, or tender buttons. The structure of rhyme as an individual book would have made Duncan's role in the formal elaboration of the American prose poem apparent, something for which he has never received sufficient credit. 1960 was also the year of the new American poetry, which was also why Duncan was in constant contact with Donald Allen. To hear Duncan tell it years later, Allen had been little more than Duncan's apprentice in the creation of that anthology. And some of the women not included there, there were only four women among the 44 poets, um, have concluded that its sexual politics do indeed reflect Duncan's influence. But what interests me today is just how much opening of the field was itself no less of a power play than the anthology. One thing is clear. Duncan worked hard to reconfigure our understanding of, American poetry, of the American poetry landscape at the exact moment he was trying to launch his defining project, a place of first permission, everlasting omen of what is.